Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. We extol you. We magnify your name tonight. You are worthy, O oh Lord. You are worthy, O oh Lord. We worship you. We magnify you. We glorify you. You can talk, okay? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You can actually talk out loud. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah! Woo! Glory. Hallelujah. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. You may be seated if you'd like. So tonight, um, I want to set the stage for um, how we're going to approach this book. So first of all, um, that my teaching style is a little bit different. You can see I don't have a TV, okay? <laughs> I, I use the whiteboard, okay? So I, I like to write. Um, the other thing is, is that we are going to study this together, Okay, together. So we're going to need a Bible. Okay, have you a Bible? You got a Bible? Okay, good. So you need a Bible. Um, I, would, I would actually prefer if you had a physical Bible rather than your phone. Okay, just, just saying. Uh, I'll try not to teach, uh, teach like I teach the college kids. So, um, <laughs> you know, a physical book is good. Okay, it's good. It's good to have a book. Um, but what we're going to do is, um, if you have some question as we go along, okay, I, I want you to go ahead and raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to answer the question as we go. I'm not going to have a question and answer session at the end. Okay? Uh, the other thing is, your question must be about what we're talking about. Okay? We're, we're barely going to get into chapter 1. So... That video was 1 through 22. <laughs> if, you read, if you read the entire book, you recognize it's the whole thing. Okay? Um, a funny thing about songs, they don't necessarily have to be biblically accurate. <laughs> okay? So just saying that don't get fooled sometimes by, by songs. Uh, Good students of the Bible will kind of look at that and go, hmm, I don't think, um, I don't think that was right. <laughs> so it's okay to do that. Okay, so, um, so tonight let's talk about the book of Revelation. Okay, so let me just find out, because this is how I like to teach. Um, let me find out what you know. So somebody tell me one thing you know about the book of Revelation. Jeremy? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. What else? Josh? Hey, recorded by John. What else? It shifts the focus from the church to Israel. Okay. Okay, that's all good. One more. Dulcia? Okay, so we got messages to the two seven churches. Now, you, you kind of surprised me because nobody went further than chapter f two. <laughs> right, no problem, okay? Um, what happens like towards the end of the book? The wrath. Okay? The wrath, and, and as Andrew said, we win, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so
So this is one of the topics that happens in this book. Okay? So first of all, you cannot understand any scripture unless you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Do we have anybody filled with the Holy Ghost? Okay, so how do you prove it? Okay, just telling somebody that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just watch the news, folks. Just telling somebody that you know something doesn't cut it, okay? So we know we're full of the Holy Ghost because, well, if you're a good AG person, because I speak in tongues, okay? Great, wonderful, but that's not the entire thing, is it? No. We know we're full of the Holy Ghost because we live right, Ooh. We live right, we desire to follow Jesus, right? And we, we govern our lives with those thoughts. And we can only do that, we can only please God if we are full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. Okay? Faith is an interesting word. In the Greek is pistis, which just means trust. That's all it means, trust. So we have to know what we're trusting. What are we trusting in? Okay. So let me ask this question. So in the book of Revelation, what is the main theme or what are the main themes of the book? Like if you had to like do a cliff note on the book of Revelation, what, what topics would you put down? Like what's a running theme throughout the book? Okay, we have, we have Jesus Christ, right? That he runs through the book. We have redemption that runs through the book, right? We have, oh, we don't like this one, but we have a separation that runs through the book. Right? Where there's going to be a great separation of believers and unbelievers. And we've got to talk about how do you know which camp you're in. Ooh, okay, this is gonna get this is gonna get real deep like real quick. So just like whoop, swim out to the deep end. <laughs> okay? If you need your floaty, raise your hand, we'll we'll throw you one, okay? But we're gonna we're gonna have to dive into this because we have to understand number one, that we are saved from the wrath of God. But number two is how do you know you're saved? from the wrath of God? That's the biggest question. Like, how do I know that I'm really saved? How do I know I'm really doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Okay, so we're going to cover that. Then, towards the end of the book, as you saw in the video, we have a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, we, we also saw that we're going to have the fulfillment of the last biblical feast. So, we also have to understand that John was of what nationality? He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. Okay? So, did he look at, uh, for example, when he was writing down the vision, did he say, well, let me check this with the, you know, 1 Corinthians? No. There was no 1 Corinthians. There was no New Testament. Okay? So, John is writing this revelation that is given to him by God through Jesus Christ at the ministry of angels and or directly from Jesus. Jesus directly spoke to John in several occasions throughout the entire book. Okay? So we have to understand that Jesus came to fulfill all of the prophecies that are in the Old Testament. Okay, everybody, everybody good so far? Because there were no New Testament prophecies because there was no New Testament. Okay? I, I'm going to hammer that point for 22 chapters, okay? So <laughs> it's going to be a long time. Okay? A long time we're going to... So you have to understand that the church, as we think of the church, did not exist. It did not exist. We have the mentality of projecting Western Christianity 2023 
ideals and ideas onto biblical passages that don't fit. One of the things that you have to know is that if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the Jewish roots. And, that, and that's how we're going to approach the study. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to look at, okay, well, John was Jewish. So when John said this, what did that mean to the Jewish people of his day? Because all of the born-again people, except for a few Gentiles, were Jewish. It wasn't until later on, about 400 A.D., that the, the big substitution happened because of political in climates. So the Jews were persecuted and smushed down, and the Gentiles rose up and created a state church. That was not the intent that Jesus came here for. That was not the intent of Acts chapter 2. That was not the intent at all. And we've been spending hundreds, thousands of years to try to reverse that. Okay, so that's where we're kind of coming from. Now, the last feast, there are seven feasts that are listed in the Old Testament. Three of them you had to show up in Jerusalem for. Okay? But the very last feast that has not been fulfilled is which one? The ingathering. Okay? So in Hebrew, it's Sukkot. And we know it as the Feast of Tabernacles, or the ingathering, because it happens in the harvest. It's part of the harvest time. Okay? So the Feast of Tabernacles is the feast that has not yet been fulfilled by Jesus. Okay? So when is he going to do it? When he sets up his millennial reign, and at the very end when we get the new heaven and the new earth. That's the fulfillment of that, because the Feast of Tabernacles, let's look at it in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. So I am not in a hurry with studying this book um, because, again, my, again, my, my uh, underlying emphasis here is to help you learn how to study the Bible. That, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm after. I want to teach you how to study the Bible. So if, if, we, if somebody says, oh, well, he's going to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. So you may think you know what the Feast of Tabernacles is, but sometimes you actually need to go look it up. Okay, so Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18 says this. Uh, maybe I'll go up a little bit higher. Um, I'll, I'll start at 12. Now, I have, um, I've been blessed with this book. This is called the Complete Jewish Study Bible. Okay, so... Uh, it's really good because, well, uh, sometimes it's a little bit hard because they put the Jewish names in there, and I'm like, who's that? Like, you know, because what we think it is and how it is actually is not really the same thing. But let me read this to you out of this <coughs> passage. I'm going to start with uh, verse 11. It says, Be careful not to forget Adonai, your God, by not obeying the mitzvot, okay, which is the... The, the law, again, rulings and regulations that I am giving you today. This is, who's, who's talking here? Who? Moses, okay? And in Hebrew, Moses is Moshe, M-O-S-H-E, okay? So just in case you hear me say Moshe, that's Moses, okay? Otherwise, after you have eaten and are satisfied, built fine houses and lived in them, and increased your herds, flocks, silver, gold, and everything else you own. Wow, that sounds like God is really looking out to bless his people. Amen? Uh, you can do better than that. Amen? <laughs> I guess you're too blessed. Okay, great. You will become proud-hearted. Oh, no. Okay. Forgetting Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, where you lived as slaves, who led you through the vast and fearsome desert with its poisonous snakes, scorpions, and waterless, thirsty ground, who brought water out of flint rock for you, 
who fed you in the desert with manna, unknown to your ancestors, all the while humbling and testing you in order to do you good in the end. Oh, that's important. Verse 17, this is where we get the Feast of Tabernacles. You will think to yourself, my own power and the strength of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. No, you are to remember Adonai your God because it is he who gives you the power to gain wealth. Okay? And in, in order to confirm his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors, as is happening even today. If you forget Adonai your God, follow after other gods and serve them, I am warning you in advance that you will certainly perish. So the concept here is that this feast, which is part of the feast of the ingathering, as Josh said, and the, the feast of tabernacles, where they commemorated the 40 years that they spent in the desert. Okay, so they built booths or tabernacles and, and slept under them for a week. So the festival lasted for a week. And you can read in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and further in Deuteronomy, Ezra, and Nehemiah, it talks about how the people celebrated this holiday. Okay? So what we're looking for <coughs> is we're looking for Adonai, God, the Father, to come back and live with us. We always talk in, in Christian circles, we talk about, oh, we, we need to get back to the Garden of Eden. And what do we mean by that? We mean that we need to get back to the place where we had free relationship with the Father, unhindered and untainted by sin. Okay? That's where we have to get. Now, we're going to be very surprised to find out that what Jesus did on the cross actually provided that. That's, it's going to be a little scary because... God's going to raise the bar tonight on what he has as an expectation of his people. Okay, so we're going to find that out in a few minutes. Now, Jesus um, fulfilled this, and we're going to show you that from the New Testament. So there were two important ceremonies during the Feast of Tabernacles. One was that the Hebrews carried torches around the temple. And they lit up lamps or menorahs along the walls of the temple. Okay? And the walls of the temple were uh, lit up to demonstrate that Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. Because your walls shall be called salvation. And your gates... Where are my Bible students? Holy cow, what happened here? <laughs> Praise. Praise, thank you. Okay. Your walls shall be called salvation. When we read that in Psalms, we're like, what are you talking about? Like our church? Like we're going to have walls of our church? No, he's talking about the temple. They're talking about the temple. They're talking about this feast. They're talking about the fact that they go every year and they commemorate the the, the word of the Lord, and they declare the word of the Lord by saying, our walls shall be salvation. Salvation to your people, Israel, and to the Gentiles. Notice they didn't leave us out. Gentiles are leaving the Jews out, but we're, they didn't leave us out. Because God didn't leave us out. So even though God chooses the Israel people, the Israelites, the Hebrew people as his people, he made a provision for Gentiles to come in. He didn't exclude you. Not, I'm, I mean, anyone Jewish? Every once in a while, we, we get somebody who actually, you are? You, oh. Uh, that, that has natural... Jewish blood. They're, they're naturally Hebrew. Okay? But the rest of us are not. <laughs> we came from that land called Gentile. Okay? So we're out there, and, and I want you to get this because the, the, the philosophy we have now is we're so important because we're the church, and the Jewish people are not important because they rejected the Messiah. Ah! That's not entirely correct. <laughs> okay, on both ends. 
Okay? So the, the concept is, is that we're, they, they go around and they declare things. They declare what the Word says. And, you know, the, the, the problem is, is that when you get people who take the Word of God and use it for personal gain, and, and we're all really good at, yeah, you, 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 you. But really, there's four fingers going this way, right? <laughs> because we do the same thing. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, we justify our sin before God. We say, oh, I didn't really mean that. But we're going to find out, oh, you really did. <laughs> hey, you really did. You know, there, there's really something about that. Um, so that's the first thing, right? So the first thing is, is that the declaration of salvation. We should be declaring and reminding the Lord of his word. You said our walls will become salvation and our gates praise because the nations are coming in to the kingdom. Don't be satisfied with people. Go for nations. Nations have to come in. God God asked the prophet, can a nation be born again in a day? And he didn't even wait for their answer. He said, yes. <laughs> he doesn't wait sometimes for the stupid answer. He, he just go ahead and gives you the right answer, right? We need to be praying for the nations. The nations have to come in. Okay? We can start with America. That would be great, okay? Great to have a revival in America, but we, the American revival is nothing compared to the worldwide revival that is desired. Jesus has promised the nations as his inheritance. He paid the price for the nations. He's not satisfied without the nations. He's not going to be satisfied until we make his enemies his footstool. And it's so fun because he already provided the way to do it. And then, you know, it's sort of like, you know, when you uh, are allowing your child for the first time to try something, and you know that they're probably not going to get it right the first time, so you kind of fix everything so it actually works out. <laughs> right? So it's like you fix it. Like, I couldn't make a mistake, right? And, uh, some kids do, but, you know, most of the time you fix it so th they're going to get it right and they're going to feel good about themselves. That's what God did. He said, I want you to subdue my enemies, and just to help you out, I'll take away all his power. <laughs> and if, yet if you don't get that part, I'll give you the power that raised me from the dead so that now you can actually feel like you can do this. <laughs> oh, you still don't believe me. Okay, well, if you can't handle those two things, then I'm going to come do it myself is basically how God's looking at this. He's like, oh, like church, you want to call yourself the church, well, you got to act like it. you got to act like the church. you got to act like my governing body, my assembly in the earth. Because I came to establish a kingdom. I didn't come, he says, I didn't come to bring, you know, love, joy, peace, and have all that great, wonderful feelings and sit around the campfire and sing kumbaya. I didn't come for that. He came to divide. He came and said, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats because there's a lot of goats who run around thinking they're sheep. Whoops. Um, so he's like, look, it, the, the days of playing around and playing around with the word are over. And if you don't recognize that, you're at, you must be living somewhere where there is no cell service, there's no cable, and you live in a rock somewhere, like a cave somewhere. Because everywhere else you turn around, you see that it's, it, the, the, game, the fun and game time is over. You know, we, we don't need Bozo the Clown and Foo Foo the Dog to get people to come to church anymore. They're recognizing... Uh, it's getting bad out here. I better find a sanctuary. That's why we call them sanctuaries. It's a place of safety. Okay? But the only safety we have is in Jesus Christ. 
Okay, oh yeah, you're coming alive. Okay, yay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It takes my class a good 45 minutes to warm up and then we got to go. So I want you to think in, in class. I, I don't want you to just like, you know, take things and not, not think about them because those days are over. You've got to be able to explain somebody what salvation is about. You, you've got to be able to do that because people are going to be asking you, they're going to pull on your coattails and going to say, take me to the Lord. Give me the word of the Lord because they're hungry for the word of the Lord. Do you realize that this is the very last book of the Bible? Have you, have you gotten that part? Hey? <laughs> This was written in 95 A.D. This is 2023 A.D. We haven't heard anything new from God since the last chapter of the book. And what do you say at the last point? Get ready, I'm coming back. Signing off, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so that's what it is. Okay, so here we go. Um, the second ceremony is the priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam and carry it to the temple where it was poured into a silver basin beside the altar. The priest called upon the Lord to provide heavenly water in the form of rain for their supply. Okay, that's that rock that followed them in the desert. And Paul says the rock was Jesus Christ. The rock followed them and provided water. The Father provided food. Okay? So when Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life, he wasn't kidding. He's like, I am the bread of life. Come and eat. I am the bread of life. Okay? And, and people reacted just like they did in the desert. Um, so also during this ceremony, the people looked forward to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, which is uh, you know, given to us in the book of Joel. So at the feast, Jesus spoke these words. So now uh, let's take a look at John chapter 7. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 37 and 38. On the last and greatest day of the festival... Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He, he was doing that as the priest was pouring the water in the silver basin. The Jews knew what the priest was doing. They knew the symbolism of what that meant. That meant that they, in the desert, God provided water because they were thirsty. It would be a good idea sometime to, to Google the Zin Desert, the wilderness, and get a, like a visual picture of what that looks like, because we have this concept, we have like a misconstrued concept sometimes of what it looks like. I mean, we're talking dry. <laughs> when Ezekiel said, can these dry bones live? It was dry, very dry, okay? So it, it's, it's very, very dry. So Jesus says, I look at uh, he says, I am, where did I go? Uh, look, anyone who is thirsty to come and drink, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Who's that? Who's he talking about there? Hopefully you, right? I mean, you should, you should say me, Okay. <laughs> Uh, me, because I, do, do I believe in Jesus? Well, what do I believe? I believe that my sins are forgiven and rivers of living water are going to flow out of me. Well, where are the living waters going to go? To the dry places. Well, where are they? The people who are thirsty. Hey. Okay. Put it all together, folks. Okay? <laughs> there, you're, you're around people who are thirsty. They don't know how thirsty they are. 
Do you know when you're, when you're getting to that point of not drinking water and you go into dehydration, you don't even feel thirsty anymore? That's the danger point. Okay? So people who live in like Arizona and places that are very arid, they have to, they have to remind themselves, drink water because they don't feel thirsty. So we've got people out there who are thirsty and they're starting to wake up to the fact that they're thirsty. And if you come with living water, they're going to see the living water and they're going to say, give me something to drink. Just as Jesus said to the woman at the well, you don't know who you're talking to. Right? You don't know who you're talking to. You're talking to somebody who can give you living water. He gave us living water. We got to act like he gave us living water. Oh, this Baptist church is pretty, it's pretty silent tonight. <laughs> I'm going to convince you that you're born again and full of the Holy Ghost by the time we're done with Revelation. Okay? <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> my goal is to wake you up enough that you realize, hey, wait a minute. Like, I, hey, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, that's me. That's me, right? Okay. Whew, we'll get there. Yeah. Chapter 8, verse 12. So remember, him saying, I'm living water, is the second part of that ceremony where the priest pours the water. The first part of the ceremony was the lighting of the lamps. Chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says these words. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice he said never twice. If you come to me for a drink, you will never thirst. If you believe in me, you will never walk in darkness. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, the whole point of, of, of that of the Feast of Tabernacles is the truth that Israel's life and our lives too because we're grafted into Israel. We are grafted in to the promise. Okay? Because we've already established nobody in here has Jewish roots. <laughs> so we have no claim to the lineage of Abraham. We do have claim, 100% claim to the faith of Abraham. And it was the faith of Abraham that God considered to be righteous. Because there was no other, the, he didn't have a kid, remember? So when, he, when they did, God exchanged that covenant, Abraham was as good as dead because he didn't have a son yet. And he was kind of like talking to God about that, like, well, what do you, like how am I going to work this out? Like, I got all this stuff, you blessed me so much, I got so many camels and donkeys, and like, who am I going to leave it to? My cousin? Like, uh, you know, my servant boy, like, well, uh, God's like, what are you talking about? I told you you're going to have a son. <laughs> so God reinforced it. Okay. So we must be anchored in God's word. Okay. We must be anchored in God's word. So we are going to be Bereans. You remember who they are? Paul said, oh, the Bereans, they're more noble than you Macedonians, okay? Because they study the scriptures, okay? They study the scriptures, and that's what we're going to do because God's word illuminates our salvation. So I, th I was led by the Lord to cover the topic of the Old Testament sacrificial system because we have this misconception about the Old Testament. We think, oh, they, they, they killed the animals and the, and the blood just covered over. Okay, I got bad news for you. Okay? They did kill the animals, okay? So they did do that. <laughs> but the blood actually atoned their sin. Forgave their sin. So it's not like they're like waiting around like, Wow, I got like a lot of sins that are under that blood and someday they got to be cleansed. No, they were cleansed. But I'm going to show you that not all of it was cleansed. 
Okay? So we're going to go to Pastor Craig's favorite book, Leviticus. <laughs> so in Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, if you are Jewish, and since none of us are, I'll have to tell you, um, if you are Jewish, the book of Levit Leviticus is actually the most important book of the five books of the Bible. And you say, what? I read that, man. It's like, ooh. <laughs> well, the, the reason it's like, ooh, for us is we don't understand the theme of it. The whole theme of Leviticus is to set up God's justice system. His justice system is made up of two parts. Now, somebody who's Jewish, and since none of us are, we're safe. Um, but for the sake of what we're going to talk about, God's justice system. Now, let, let's, let's just stop there for a minute. Why do I have to have a justice system? Because I have lawbreakers. Okay? Well, who are they? Me. <laughs> That's the point to say me. Hey, me, I'm a lawbreaker. No, I'm not. I'm a Christian. Oh, no, you're a lawbreaker. Trust me, okay? I saw you cut me off on the highway, okay? I know you, okay? Yes, we have to have a justice system, and we think, we think in natural terms that, that oh, this is God's prison sentence. This is God's prison sentence, you know, system. This is, he's going to send them away. No, he's not. God's justice system is to bring redemption. Redemption is his goal. Redemption is always his goal. Redemption is his goal from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22. After the fall. Okay? So after the fall to the end of the Bible, the whole plan is redemption. That's God's justice system. So God said to himself, look, I got, I got a bunch of lawbreakers because one family decided to break the law. Therefore, everybody after them has broken the law. So I have to have a system to put them back into fellowship with me. I have to be able to redeem them. Because we have to understand that the Father, his, his primary purpose is to come back into fellowship with us. And, and, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, depending on what kind of father we had growing up, we may or may not believe that. And that, that's unfortunate, okay? That, that's unfortunate for us. But what we have to do is we have to meditate on the character of the father so that we, re, as Paul said, transform our minds, renew our minds, which basically says take out those old stinky thoughts and put in new thoughts, that are actually biblically correct. God the Father desires you. He wants you. He wants you to jump in his lap. He wants you to dance around with him if that's your thing. He wants you to sing with him if that's your thing. He wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to come to him. But we're like, no, I can't. And he's like, why? I provided the way. Right? Okay, so we're going to get there. So the justice system has two parts. We're going to have the, the part that we call the law. Okay? So we have the law. And in, in the, in the um, idea of the law, then we also have this, this idea of the sacrificial system. Now, in Jewish th thinking, they, they only refer to it as the law, which includes the sacrifices. But to help to separate this for us a little bit, we're going we're gonna to separate them. Okay? So let's take a look at this. <coughs> so since the fundamental thread that, that goes throughout the whole Bible is redemption, okay, and redemption is the, is the restoring of a relationship between the Father and mankind, us, people, okay? 
So in Hebrew, this is referred to as mishpat. Okay, mishpat. Okay, that, that's what we talk about as far as redemption. And I'm giving you these words because who knows, you might be talking, you may someday talk to somebody who's Jewish. Okay, so, so Jesus... Now, let me ask you this, students of the Bible. So when Jesus was talking about himself, how did he refer to himself? Okay, we have Son of God. Anything else? Hmm? Hey, Alpha and Omega. Son of the sacrificial lamb, was he the son of anybody else? Son of, son of God. So Jesus said all these things. You're positive, Jesus said all these things. I am the son of God. Not my Bible. I don't know which one you have. Eh? When, when they asked, when, when Jesus was referring to himself, he said, the son of man. The son of man. So that's something we're going to get into. Okay? The difference between the son of God and the son of man. But real quick, little, little preview. We think by him saying the son of God, that shows his divinity. And it does not. His divinity is this phrase, the son of man. And you say, wait, where'd you get that? Daniel chapter 7. <laughs> okay, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of somebody, we sang about it, coming in the clouds. Okay? The rest of it's not tri- true, like, you know, coming in the clouds, not necessarily riding on the horse. Okay? But anyways, he's coming in the clouds, And he says, I saw one like the Son of Man. And we're going to find out why he said like the Son of Man. And if you read that vision, at the end of the vision it says, I was so disturbed, I sat and stared, I think for three days. And he went pale. In other words, it shook him to the core. Because he was like, what was that? because it was completely different than he was brought up to believe. So Jesus uh, always, pretty much always referred to himself as the Son of Man until he was asked directly, are you the Son of God? And he said, I am. Okay? Other than that, he pretty much, if you, if you read the Gospels, when he refers to himself, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Okay? So just keep that kind of rolling. You can study that on your own a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so we say that, that Jesus came and he, and he fulfilled the justice system requirements. Right? Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, and he is our sacrifice. Well, what, what price did Jesus have to pay for this? His life, okay? So the idea behind the book of Leviticus is that God is showing the people the two aspects of his justice system, and he's providing a way through a sacrificial system and methodology for them to come into relationship with him. <clears throat> the fullness of that relationship will be when the Lamb of God, who is spotless and blameless, has been sacrificed, and then the whole thing has been paid. So when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, it is finished. The price has been paid. And he's referring to Leviticus Because God is a just God. God is a God of justice. And God said, you sinned, 
but I'm going to provide the answer. Okay? So if you read the book of Job, Job got hit with the devil's shenanigans, right? So he's, he's in his misery, and, and he's kind of spouting off to God, like, you know, how can you do this to me? You know, like, I, I followed you all the days of my life. And God said, look, can you provide your own salvation? Can you show me your right arm? Can, is your right arm strong enough to bring you salvation, to forgive your sins? And Job's like, whoa, okay, that's too much. <laughs> Like, I, I repent, Lord, sorry, you know, please don't kill me, you know. And, but God was making the point. We can't be our own Savior. Okay? So we have to figure out how Jesus did that. Okay, so we know that Jesus um, was the fulfillment of the law and the system, and until then, God had a substitution for Jesus, and those were the animals. Okay? So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay? Amen. Okay? One of the major characteristics of God that we don't typically like is that he divides, he elects, and he separates. I'll say that again. Okay? One, one aspect of God that we can't really like too much is that he divides, he divides things, he elects certain people, and he separates people. Now, we have this concept that we're all equal. Mm, not really. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Okay, good. Okay. How many were in Jesus' inner circle? Two, four, three. <laughs> okay, so we got two, three, four, five, anybody? Five, 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 going once, going once, going, no, no, okay. Three, who were they? Peter, James, John. Okay, were Peter, James, and John the first disciples that Jesus called? No. Well, wait a minute, they're the first ones. They, they should be the ones that are in the inner circle. No. The father told him, Peter, James, John, bring them in. Who was with Jesus when he raised the Jairus' daughter from the dead? Peter, James, John. Who was there when he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, John. Whose mother went and said, hey, I think one son should sit at your right hand, one at your left? James and John. Okay, <laughs> I don't know what happened to Peter's mother, but, <laughs> but Peter, James, and John. Who do we read about after Acts chapter 2? Peter. Now the James that, I that was the overseer of the church in Jerusalem was actually Jesus' brother James, not, not James the disciple. Okay, okay, good, good. Hey, we're getting there. So what does God divide, elect, and separate? Well, start in Genesis. He divided light from dark. He divided evil from good. He divides truth from deception. He divides uh, order from chaos. He divided Israel from everyone else. He divides the holy and the profane. He actually calls some things holy. The only reason they're holy is because he calls it holy. Okay? That, so if you're reading through the Old Testament, you're like, why is that holy and that not holy? He said, that's holy. That's not holy. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We think there has to be some underlying reason for why God does what he does. No, there isn't. Sometimes he tells us, Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he just said, look, this is the way it is. That's holy. You can eat the cow, but you can't eat the pig. Why? Why? What's, what's wrong with the pig? You're like, I said it's not holy. <laughs> like what part of I say it's not holy don't you get? Okay. <laughs> like Moses, speak to the rock. There are these Israelites, bam. 
Oh, Moses, that's too bad. Do you realize what happened to Moses when he hit the rock? This is Moses. Moses, the man. He's the man. And he was not allowed to go into the promised land because he made one mistake. Leaders, one mistake. He didn't give glory to God. He didn't listen to the Holy Ghost. He didn't speak to the rock. We look at that like, that's unfair. Oh, take that up with God, man, (laughs) because I said, speak to the rock. (laughs) I didn't say hit the rock. I said, speak to the rock. Now, if you want to dive a little deeper into that one, who was the rock that's following them along that brings the water? It's not time to smite the lamb. It's time to declare. Okay, hey, we're good. What else does God do? He, he divides the acceptable from the unacceptable. Let me put that in plain English. Forgiven and condemned. We don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear that people are going to be condemned. And, and, and let, me, let me just give you the little preview to that, okay? Although Pastor Craig may do the seven bowls. Uh, <laughs> and that'll scare us all, right? Uh, so... <laughs> But we're not talking, okay, if you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I might be one of the condemned. Okay, if you had that thought, you're probably not. Okay, because these are people who, no matter what God says, no matter what God displays in front of them, he has angels flying out of the sky telling them to repent. And they're like, no. That's what they did. They went, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not repenting. Uh, there's only one place for you. That's it. Let me, let me just say this about hell. We say hell is a separation from God, right? Okay. Now, if you did not like God and you were defiant against God, would that be punishment for you to be separated from him? No. It's what you want. <laughs> right? It's what you're, that's what, how you lived your life the whole time. Like, I don't want you. Okay? So what is hell? Hell is torture. Hell is pain. Hell is not some place where you're separated from God because that, that's actually what you wanted in the first place. No, he's going to replay the video for you where he gave you time after time after time after time after time to repent and come into the kingdom and to forget your sins to for, be forgiven through the blood of Jesus, and you said, no, 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 no. So he said, good, then if that's the way you want to be, then you go to your father, the devil. And he is merciless. There are no parties in hell. You know, I mean, you know, the poor rockers, they, they had it wrong. There's no party in hell. You're not going to go down there and see your friends unless you hate them. Then you'll see them all the time, okay? Anything you hate, anything you're afraid of, anything that brings fear into your body and into your mind, you will experience in hell forever, forever. If you had a drug problem, you will be on drugs the entire time you're in hell. And it won't help. It won't help. That's, that's how you have to think of hell. Hell is not just being separated from God and the poor people are living in darkness. No, no. They are, they are so deep in darkness that darkness scares them. People, if, if, if you have any fears, multiply that by a million. And that's a taste of what hell is like. Okay? So, we, we have to realize that that's, that's, that's the, the, the fate. And the book of Revelation is very clear that at some point in time, the Father only knows when, some point in time, he's going to say, show's over, judgment day, 
time to have the reckoning. As they say in the South, time to have your meeting with Jesus. <laughs> I heard somebody say that one time in an interview at, at, at my university. I'm like, you said, you said Jesus? <laughs> I was like, like, oh my God. I, I was expecting the walls to fall down, right? And, 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 it, I, and then they're like, I'm, I'm, you know, I was talking to somebody and they're like, oh, that's just a saying in the South. Yeah, it's to have a meeting with somebody. That's a very serious meeting. It's like, I'm going to have my meeting with Jesus. Okay? Like, okay. <laughs> I tried it. It didn't go over too well. So <laughs> I thought I'd ride that horse a little longer, but, you know, it, it just kind of got up and left. Um, number two, God divides sin. Now, this is going to step on your toes, so just get them out there now. God divides sin into two categories unintentional and intentional okay there are two types two sins unintentional and intentional contrary to popular belief there are different degrees of sin One's not just the same as the other. Okay? Remember God divides, elects, separates. There are unintentional sins. Okay? So these are sins that you do not commit with the understanding that you are committing the sin. Okay? So it'd be like you're driving down the highway, you have not seen the speed limit sign yet. Okay? That, that's kind of like the analogy, and, and you're flying along. You get pulled over, and you tell, and the, I, I mean, this happened to me once. The officer goes, do you, did you see the sign? And I'm like, no, where was it? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I was honest. I'm like, I didn't see the sign. He said, well, bow, bow back there in mile marker, whatever. I'm like, well, I got on after that. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to give you a warning now, okay? So I'm like, I didn't know what the speed limit was. I didn't have my Waze on. Okay, Waze tells you the speed limit, by the way, if you want to get that program. Okay? <laughs> then it would be, and they would go from this to this. If I know the speed limit and I intentionally break the speed limit, there is no mercy. Okay? No matter who you are. Okay? If you have somebody that's upholding the law. So we have two different types of sin. Unintentional and intentional. The sacrificial system that God instituted with the, the slaying of the animals and the spilling of the blood and the altar and the burning and the, all that sacrifice stuff that we think of when we think of the Old Testament was only for this. Only for this. Unintentional sin was atoned for. You can be forgiven for the unintentional sins by offering the prescribed sacrifice. Now, animal sacrifices were not new to Israel. They lived in the Middle East. This happened all the time. Okay? They had pagan gods that they would sacrifice things to, but they didn't sacrifice the animals to their pagan gods to get their sins forgiven. That's the new twist. God's like, Okay, I'm going to take something you're familiar with, killing of a lamb, but you're going to pr do the killing of the lamb a certain way. You're going to put the blood in a certain place, and that will forgive your sin. They're not covered over, so that I'm going to dig them up later. No, they're forgiven. They're forgiven. Okay? Forgiven. Therefore, I feel no shame or guilt. Because my sins have been forgiven when they're unintentional. Sometimes in the book of Leviticus, you have to make reparations. If you dug a hole and forgot to cover, uh, you know, and, and you didn't put a fence around it, and somebody's donkey came along and broke their leg because they fell in the hole, that was unintentional. That could be forgiven. But you have to, you have to pay for the donkey. Okay? Right? 
Now, if you put a sign with an arrow on that says, donkey, go this way, <laughs> and you dig a hole in the road, and you know the donkey's going to go in the hole in the road, that's intentional. You read about it in the Bible. If, if, if somebody throws a stone, and they didn't know that somebody else was on the other side of the hill, and the stone hits them and they die, that's unintentional. That sin, even though it's murder, can be atoned for. But if you're standing face to face with somebody and you throw a stone at them and you kill them, that's intentional. <laughs> In our system, we call them misdemeanors and felonies. <laughs> well, now, now, you know, it used to be that one of them you could you can get out on and the other one you have to stay for, but now everybody gets out. So I don't know how it's working. <laughs> hey? We're not going to get it political, okay? So, so what, was, what was the product or what was the result if I committed an intentional sin? Bad news. You were not forgiven. There was no provision for intentional sin. You say, wow, that's pretty harsh. Oh, how can that be harsh? God's, oh, because you don't read the book of Leviticus. Okay, so God <laughs> spelled it out. This is what I think you should live. This is how you should live. Here's Ten Commandments. Okay, if that's not good enough, here's 160 more. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all the way down to, you know, what you should do if your house has mold. I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to spell it all out to you. There is no excuse if you sin intentionally. So do you think the Israelites walked around sinning intentionally? No. You think they really tried to sin? We think they did. We think, oh, that was either, like, there we go. they just sinned, you know, and guy, they got what they deserved. How much more, in the book of Hebrews, how much more are we accountable than that we have the blood of Christ? How much more are we accountable to God for intentionally sinning and we have the blood of Christ? And we intentionally sin. Do you think God's going to go, oh? No. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> Read the book. The last, the Revelation book. Read the book. Oh, no. Oh, no. You want to trample the blood of Christ? Oh, no. You want to keep this up? Oh, no. Those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, how can they go back? How? <coughs> How can they do that? So before we get too pious, <coughs> excuse me, before we get too pious and point our finger, we need to look in the mirror. Because how many intentional sins have we made? You should be so happy <coughs> excuse me, that you did not live in the Old Testament. These people walked around with guilt and shame and condemnation. So what was the penalty for these intentional sins? <coughs> excuse me. The curse. Have you ever heard of that? Galatians 3.13. Jesus was made accursed on the tree. And I'm not cursed anymore because he is my provision. So the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? This is the law. This is the law. The curse of the law is my intentional sins. My intentional sins brings a curse. 
Paul says, whoa, this is why some of you are sick and are dying. Because you don't understand that there are intentional sins. <coughs> so here, here's the thing. The point of this is to do two things. Number one, give you an understanding of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament, they could get their unintentional sins forgiven. Not covered over, forgiven. God made a provision for them to be forgiven. He wasn't just piling them up for some day when they accept Jesus after Jesus rises from the dead. Okay? <clears throat> so what did Jesus do for us through the sacrificial system? He completely atoned our unintentional sins. That means we don't have to kill a goat anymore. Yay, the goat gets to live. Okay? So we don't have to kill the goat. We don't have to kill the lamb. We don't have to kill the pigeon. We don't have to kill anybody because Jesus was killed for us. So Jesus did one, two things in the sacrificial system. He covered and completely atoned all of our unintentional sins. And then the, here's the really, 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 really good news of the cross. He took away the penalty of our intentional sins. That's why Paul says, how can you trample the blood of Christ? How can you call yourself a Christian and keep intentionally sinning? How can you do that? And if you think that God's going to wink at that and say, well, they believe in my son. No, you don't. You don't. Because Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will obey my commandments. Which means <clears throat> that you will do everything in your power not to do this. The Israelites did everything in their power, 24-7, 365. They tried to avoid this. Now, the common folk you know, they didn't have the, the deeper understanding of the power and the gravity of what God said to them. But the, the higher-ups did. The, the people who studied the law, they fully understood. And we say, well, they were radical. They were, like, too strict, you know. Well, yeah, well, you'd be too. I mean, if, <laughs> if you knew that, that the, only, the only result of you doing this is eternal damnation and living under a curse, uh, you'd try to avoid this too. So shouldn't we, right? So what Jesus did is that he took that penalty, that curse, away. So this is what separates our beliefs from other religions because in other religions you cannot get this forgiven I'll say that again in other religions other than believers in Jesus Christ you cannot have this forgiven there is because everything that they do is in works and you can't do enough works to get this forgiven you're still under the curse if you believe in, in some other form of religion, like Buddhism, Islam, take your pick. Whatever you want. If it's not Judeo-Christian beliefs, you are under a curse. You will be under a curse until you come to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> when you talk to people, you need to make them understand that, yeah, you can go to God and say, I'm sorry, but, uh, but I'm sorry isn't really getting forgiveness for your unintentional sin. Especially because 99% of what we do is this. <laughs> and, and if we're in the church, we have really no excuse at all. But the Bible says, Paul says in Romans, that even the ignorant people, people who aren't in the family, know the law of God. 
God puts it in their heart to do right. And they intentionally do wrong. What's going to be their fate? Eternal damnation. They're going to live under a curse. So that's the sacrificial system. So Jesus, meditate on this, because this is going to be revolutionary to your mind. Like, like okay, so I really thought I was saved, but actually I was lost. Because coming down here and saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, turning around and going and do exactly what you did before you came here is not salvation. Hey, I'll try that one more time. So if you come down the aisle and you stand here and you say, I'm sorry, forgive me of my sins, I, I asked Jesus into my heart, and you turn around and you walk out and you do exactly what you did before you came here, you're not saved. You came down here and said some words. You're not saved. That's not salvation. Salvation is, I fully understand I deserved death. And if I don't live right, I'm going to deserve death. If I don't trust in Jesus' blood every day, I deserve death. I deserve the curse. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. <coughs> He didn't say, if you love me and say my name six times, you'll be saved. Mm -mm, that's not what he said. Redem or, uh, repentance is not just saying I'm sorry. Repentance means I've got to change how I live. That's why Paul said, look, <coughs> excuse me. In Romans, he said, you know, we have that passage of, you know, Paul saying, I know what I should do, but I don't do what I know I should do. I do what I don't, what I know I shouldn't do. You know, why do I do that? Because the law of sin and death is still in my flesh. I have to subdue my flesh. I'm not to the point where I've renewed my mind enough that I control my body and shut it down. But I'm working towards the goal. He's working towards the goal, and the Holy Ghost is going to help him get to the goal. Because you think that God is going to provide a sacrifice for your forgiveness of intentional sins and not give you the power to live it? That's a warped God, man, if you have that one. Hey? That's not the Jesus that we know. Jesus that we know, he's going to not only provide the sacrifice for the unintentional sins, he's going to take away the curse of your intentional sins, but he demands that you live right. He's not suggesting it. He's demanding that you live right. And you say, well, I don't know how to live. Open the book. <laughs> hey, open the book. We can't say we follow Christ and never read the book. <coughs> I'm getting too much preach here. So let's, let's look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. This is a pretty familiar scripture. Romans 3.23. And, and again, I'm going to read it out of the complete Jewish Bible. <coughs> So, Romans 3, 23 to 35 is where I'm going to read. Well, let me start at 21. But now, quite apart from Torah, which is God's law, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear. Through the Torah and the prophets, the law and the prophets, give their witness to it as well. And it is a righteousness that comes from God through the faithfulness of Yeshua. Now, I want, I want to stop right there because the English translations will always put the word God. But if you look it up in the original language, this is Yahweh. Jehovah 
Okay? This is God the Father. We've got, like I said earlier, we've got to renew our mind that the Father wants a relationship with us. He wants it so bad, he sent his son. He sent his son, right? So the Father, through the faithfulness of Yeshua the Messiah, to all who continue trusting, for it makes no difference whether one is a Jew or a Gentile. Hey, that covers us all, okay? Since all have sinned and come short of earning God's praise, by God's grace, without earning it, we all are granted the status of being considered righteous before him through the act redeeming us from our enslavement to sin. Our enslavement to sin. Why do you intentionally sin? Because you're a slave to sin. You've got to renew your mind that Jesus came to break your slavery. He set you free. He set you free from the bondage and the enslavement of sin. We think that there's no other way except that we sin. And, and God's saying, no, you got it wrong. He gave you the ability to cut the chains and walk free. He's looking for a people who choose to do what is right. Hey, I'm just saying. That was accomplished by Messiah Yeshua. God put Yeshua forward as the atonement for sin through his faithfulness in respect to his bloody sacrificial death. This vindicated God's righteousness. Okay? Vindicated God's righteousness because in his forbearance, he had passed over with neither punishment nor remission the sins people had committed in the past. And it vindicates his righteousness in the present age by showing that he is righteous himself and is also the one who makes people righteous on the ground of Yeshua's faithfulness. The Old Testament had no remedy, but the New Testament does. That is one of the major things about it. So what do we get? We get the good news that our sacrifice is no longer required of animals because we trust in the sacrifice of Christ. Our intentional sins have been forgiven. The curse has been removed. The chains of enslavement have been cut. You're free as a bird. Amen? That's not enough. I thought it was enough. <laughs> but, but God's like, oh no, I got one more. I got one more for you. The one more is the Passover. Jesus is also referred to as the Passover lamb. Right? So what does that mean? That means that he was not only the sacrificial lamb who was slain, he was the Passover lamb. And what was Passover all about? You remember Passover? Okay. <laughs> what, who's passing over? Let's try that one. The death angel. Okay. And how did he know who to pass over? Put the blood on the doorposts. And what was this angel called again? The who angel? The death angel. Oh, so if I didn't have the blood, I was dying? Yes. So Jesus, as the Passover lamb, says, if you, if you accept my blood and put it on the doorposts of your heart, then the second death comes around at the end of the book. Remember, we're still in Revelation. The end of the book, I will pass over you. Whoa. Not only do I get to live free, I get to live with him forever. <laughs> Guess what feast, feast that is called? Tabernacles. <laughs> How do you get in? You get in through the blood. How do you get access to the Father? Through the blood. Now, the, the, the song had, you know, I enter the Holy of Holies. I got bad news. You don't. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Little problem there, okay? Only the high priest goes in. <coughs> the way we go in, technically, is that we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. 
So through him, we get in. You don't waltz in. Okay? A, you're a Gentile. You don't even get it past the outer courts. Bad news, right? <laughs> you don't even get past that. I mean, they have a sign in the temple. Any Gentile that is found on the other side of that wall is dead. Dead. They'll kill you. Okay? So we don't just waltz in. We come into Christ. We get hidden in Christ. Christ is the only one that can walk into the Holy of Holies. So we have the, the forgiveness of our sins, unintentional and intentional, and the best news ever, we get to get around the wrath of God, which brings the second death. But let me, have, let me end with this. If we choose not to accept this, if we choose not to accept it, then we're going to be in that group of people called the unacceptables. And that's the only thing left. We live in an age where, where God is pouring out the Holy Ghost and he's drawing us in and he wants to purify his church because our church, the church, universal, is messed up. There are churches that don't even know, they don't even know that Jesus died for them. They don't even recognize the death of Jesus. I know that's hard to believe, because it's not anything that we know, but there are, that's how it is. So we're going to stop here, because that was the introduction. <laughs> yeah, we got 22 chapters. So just buckle up and it'll probably be August when we're done. Okay? <coughs> so here's your homework. Okay, so you have homework. So your homework is meditate on this concept of Leviticus and what Jesus did. Even go back and try to read Leviticus. You know, just try to figure it out a little bit. Okay? Follow, read it with the intention that this is God's system to get us back in. Okay? Also meditate on the fact that God is holy and God only allows holy to come into holy. So we, we want to get to that point, right? Where we, where we desire to live in a, in a holy manner. Now, again, you know, we've got humans that get in the way and they go like, woo, way overboard. Okay? Don't let that... that deter you and don't let that stop you. Don't let that cloud your thinking. You, you have two eyes. You can read the Bible. You read it. Okay? You read it and say, God said I should be holy. Okay? Whether somebody tells me my sleeves need to be down here or up here, I don't care. That's, that's not the issue. The issue is the holy in here. Amen? And, and read chapter 1 because we're going to have some really eye-opening things in chapter 1 right there in the first word, okay? <laughs> this is the revelation, <laughs> okay? Amen. So we're going to stop here so that uh, you can pick up your children if you have them, and if not, don't pick them up, okay? So <laughs> let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. No wonder he was in the garden desiring to know if this was your will. And no wonder you promised him as his inheritance, the nations. And Lord, we want to take this one step further because we understand that there are two sides to the cross. One side is that you were killed and you were broken for our sins and your blood covers us and cleanses us and makes us righteous. And on the flip side, it says in Isaiah chapter 53 that that the cross also brings healing to our bodies. It brings restoration to our minds. The Holy Spirit is alive in us, and, it, and the Holy Spirit tells us the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us to help us to live according to the plans and purposes that you have for us. So, Lord, we say here we are. 
We, we have intentionally sinned, and we come to you, and we, we, want to, we want to do better. Help us to renew our minds. Help us to be more resolved in, in trusting in the Holy Spirit, trusting in Jesus, and reading your word. And so, Lord, we give you the praise and you the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we say it. Amen. Amen.